the girls are fine, as you can see. Like, totally fine. So. Welcome to We Need to Talk Now, presented by AT&T. I am Alicia J, and this is Ashley Nicole Moss. Hello, hello. I'm like, I got a cashew still in the back of my tooth here. So just ignore me while I get a little snack out. in. Get yeah, a little yeah. Snack. Listen, we're always on the go. I sometimes forget to eat nuts are great in protein. Take it away. I'm very healthy. <laughs> like I'm I'm glad that you picked the healthy snack. I probably Instead of some Cheetos, right? Same. Look at me growing up. Cheetos <laughs> hit. Uh, <laughs> Cheetos hit. I'm not gonna lie. I may or may have not had a Cheeto this week, but sure did not a Cheeto. You only had one Cheeto. <laughs> um, no, nah, most okay. <laughs> I can never just eat one of I'm any about snack. To say. Of that's like any one snack. Oreo flex. Listen, no, nah, that's impossible. <laughs> if anyone says they've done that, like, that's that's a lie. Yeah, for sure. That's a for lie. sure. One Oreo. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, Ashley, I'm so glad that you pulled up with your snacks because we have <laughs> so much to talk about this week. The NWSL had a historic CBA announcement. We're going to talk all about that with Jenny Chu. I mean, just a phenomenal, phenomenal CBA um, yeah, we, and we're going to talk all about it because there are a lot of layers to it, um, but they're all really amazing. So definitely going to talk CBA and WSL CBA with Jenny Chu. And then there were two legends that had their jerseys retired this past weekend. So we're going to pay homage to both of them. But so we'll be talking. We're also going to critique it a little bit. Well, Stay we tuned. always have to, you know, talk about both sides. A little so, seasoning. A little so seasoning. definitely stay tuned for that. <laughs> Lindsay Vaughn, we had an amazing interview with the we legend. Fanned girled oh, out. I'm still fangirling. Like, I'm saying, was... like, we about to run an interview with Lindsay. Like, what? Crazy. Yeah. But we will have our interview with the legend coming up soon and so much more. We have a lot. Yeah. But first, housekeeping as usual, we want to remind you to follow us on all of our social channels, as you can see below. We're on Instagram, we're on Twitter slash X, whatever the kids are calling it these days. We're on TikTok. But if you don't want to watch us on any of these social platforms, watch us on YouTube where your notifications should be all the way turned on so you don't miss a second of the show. We got you covered if you're more of an audio person. We got a QR code right here. And if you scan this and you share it with a friend, we will pop up wherever you get your podcast. And that is on Spotify. That is on Apple. So listen, there is no excuse to not be tapping into the show. We're everywhere. We are here. Everywhere. We are there. We are everywhere. And Alicia, we also are a finalist in a pretty big competition, pretty big deal. Yeah, we definitely are. And we have to thank you because literally you guys vote us as, voted us in to be a finalist for this. So <laughs> we are a finalist for the best black hosted sports podcast. And that is on what network? It Ashley? is on the People's Choice podcast awards yes so yes. we're definitely a finalist there we are among some great names great some names big, big names too some big names and so we really appreciate you getting us to the finals and if you already voted for us look in your inbox because you probably have sitting in there the opportunity to vote for us again because that's the way that it works if you voted for us before you vote for us again in the finals so we just thank you so much for voting we thank you so much for having us as a finalist in this and we want to bring it home you know what i'm saying if like they period. didn't vote the first time around can they vote in the finalist competition, Emma, like if they missed the window to do the nomination vote, are they still, uh, they are not. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you did not vote in the first round, which was to kind of get us into the finalist round, then unfortunately yes. you can't cast a vote for the finalist round. So that makes me sad. Cause I was like, yeah. it could really run up, but I guess that would kind of be cheating. <laughs> but listen, you could cheer us on though, because we really yes. trying to win this award. You can but share you it retweet it like yes. it yes and if you know someone who did vote for us remind them to check that inbox because they can vote for us again that part right there so, check that inbox yeah check that inbox well it's gonna be a battle and speaking of battles uh-oh listen uh -oh. it is this battle has had it's just front and center for me all week okay put your cape on alicia let's go listen suit up <laughs> so, <laughs> 
The Chicago Sky just announced that they have a new mascot, which is Sky the Lioness. And Sky is cute. Let's be clear. Sky is cute. I think Emma has it. Can we put up Sky? Because I want to see, I want everyone to see what Sky looked like. Now, look, Sky is very cute. And she has a lot of tie-ins to Chicago. You see the lion that she is in front of right now. That uh -huh. Uh, definitely a Chicago like staple, like people go to see that. Um, it's it's one of the things that, you know, people kind of, they put on the little sky jerseys when, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, um, in the season and that kind of yeah. thing. They're just like a staple in Chicago. And so they're playing off of that. And, and she's, you know, really great. Like no the doubt. Name, obviously and, the Chicago sky and she's sky with an E. Sky with an E. So, yeah. And, and they said specifically, the lioness was chosen to embody strength, feminine power, mm -hmm. grace, and the courage to overcome obstacles, qualities that the Chicago Sky consistently showcase. Mm -hmm. Love it, love it, love it. But, you know, as soon as they announced that she was going to be the new mascot, mm -hmm. WNBA Twitter was all ablaze at comparing her to Ellie. Now, listen. It's your girl. That's your girl. Oh. It's my girl. <laughs> now, she doesn't really know that she's my girl like that, but she is. Okay. <laughs> now, let me tell you something. I want to get your opinion on this, Ashley. I do. Mm -hmm. But I just have to say, Ellie is an Elena for all. Oh, for, you, I mean, you just cannot compare. Right. Any, any mascot in this world, Ellie... Ellie is Ellie. There will not be another Ellie. There's no comparison. So everybody who's comparing the two, they set in Sky up for failure. She's like one, she's like a one name star, like Beyonce, Madonna. Right. You know? On Shakira. stage with Sierra. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. she, she is doing, she is everywhere doing amazing. She's a brand of her own. Let's be clear. And she also had some things to say about this. Oh, listen, she put this in her stories. So people were saying, rolling on the floor, laughing, talking about the whole comparison. And she said, just so we're clear, I'm an only child. <laughs> like, what? let people know. Let people know. And then here, watching other mascots trying to replicate Ellie. She reposted this. There's only one. Let me tell you, just, just so everybody is clear. The third one had me rolling, too, because... Now teams want to get new mascots shaking my head. Biggie Ellie is is one of one. And she reposted that too. So she's definitely in the conversation, just letting everybody know who she is. What I she mean, has done and where she she's, going. She's the mascot of the New York Liberty. She's a New York girl. And we got attitude problems. Don't come for us unless we send for you. Okay? Because if you do, we can get it on and popping. And Ellie show nobody. Listen. All right? This is how... We do it. Yeah, you're right, Emma. We already got the Chicago, New York pizza beef. We already have the Chicago, New York Italian food beef. We just going to add this to the roster. Let's run it. Let's Royal Rumble, baby. <laughs> I mean, and obviously, with that answer, you are on Ellie's side, just I like mean, I am. <laughs> but it's like, I just feel bad for Sky. You know, Sky hasn't even had a game yet. Let's let her rock. Can we just don't compare her to Ellie the Great? Like, it's, there's no comparison. Don't even put her in the conversation yet. We haven't even seen what Sky can do. Let Sky be Sky, mm -hmm. and let Ellie be Ellie. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. And I do, I do think that a lot of teams are going to follow suit because they see how important a mascot really is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think anyone will ever be as big as Ellie. And honestly, anyone who will ever as impact the culture as Ellie has. Right. Real talk. Yeah. But. Also, they just are really important things, in my opinion, to have with your team and also to enhance your brand. And even like in Ellie's case, she's a brand of her own now. So, you know, we'll see what Sky can bring to the table, but please just don't put her in the conversation with Ellie. We just we can't do that to her and, and we can't do that. And certainly Ellie doesn't need it. An interesting, um, you know, tidbit for those who don't know also, they were designed by the same person. Right, but that also makes me feel do like they have the, so is that like their dad? Is that do they share a dad? Mm, like that's that, a good that, question. You know what I mean? That's are a they, good question. Are they technically sisters? Like I'm confused now on how that works in terms but, of mascot lineage. Like you know what? <laughs> I would much rather go with that. Like they're sisters. Like let's play separated off of each at other. Birth. Separated at first. 
you know, supportive sisters, like love each other. We also have beef sometimes because we're sisters, you know, yeah. all of that. But I would much rather the narrative be that, but just don't do the comparison. That it's ain't going like on. Ellie's mom was an elephant. Sky's mom was a lioness. The dad, I don't, I don't know what the dad would be. What's the daddy look like? I don't know. Picture. Would he be a human? I don't think he can cross species. Like, I don't know. But don't know. <laughs> we got to figure out what the lineage is. And we'll get back to you guys with that. Yeah. Because um, we're still trying to figure out how that works too. But that'd be a cute storyline. Now I'm thinking about it. Well, listen, WNBA, we're going to work on that. You guys come back to us we in a week or two. We'll have this fleshed out better. <laughs> we will. But also, like, that also leads me to think, and this is my petty mind, but did Chicago. Are they trying to replicate Ellie's greatness because they went to who made her to get the new mascot? I mean, Listen, I'm just saying. Conspiracy theories. I'm here for it. Like I said, documentary coming out the soon. debate of Sky versus Ellie. This is just part one. We're going to dive into this even deeper. You guys don't want to miss future episodes of We Need to Talk Now because we're not done with this conversation. We're going to deep dive a little bit, flesh this out, and we're going to come back to you. But we're going to stick in the realm of basketball because um, there were some big Jersey retirements. We're going to start with basketball. We're going to end with soccer and Maya Moore, the goat number 23 finally got her due and got her Jersey hung in the rafters. She's the first female athlete to ever sign with Jordan who gifted her a jacket and special shoes running through her. Gold ones. In case you aren't. Yeah. Gold ones at that. Yeah. Um, running through her accolades in case you're just, you know, unfamiliar. I don't know how you could be, but that's okay. That's what we're here for to share the knowledge. Four time WNBA champion, six time WNBA finals appearances in eight seasons, six time WNBA all star, seven time all WNBA, six first team, one second team. And a girl by the name of Caitlin Clark, don't know if you've heard of her. Uh, she says that Maya Moore was her favorite player growing up she specifically remembers getting a hug from Moore. called it quote one of the most pivotal moments of my entire basketball career now interesting enough maya who's probably hung hugged hundreds of young fans said she doesn't remember but did say that when it comes to making time for young fans it's quote really really cool to think about how one of those little girls became caitlin clark yeah. Goosebumps as I read that quote. Um, and she also because, she also said too that, you know, it just goes to show that you need to be good nice. to everybody and yes. be that person to everyone because Absolutely. you never know who you're gonna impact. Absolutely. I just um got back from Charlotte and I did Grant Williams charity golf tournament, and he was telling me a story about how, you know, he's from the Charlotte area and how some of the OG Charlotte when they were the Hornets. Um, the Bobcats rather um, took time out of their day to speak to him and, and kind of just put him on game, you know, even it was 10 minutes, 15 minutes and how that just completely changed, you know, the way he looked at the game and how he viewed mentorship and how he's passing along the torch. So you never know who you can impact. It may not be an immediate impact. It could be much further down the road, but to hear that Maya Moore had the opportunity to connect with a little girl and that little girl became probably what is going to become one of the greatest players to ever play this game is just mind blowing. When you think mm -hmm. about it. such a full circle moment. Um, but we got to also represent some soccer and then we're going to dive into how this could have been better. Um, Megan Rapino, number 15. She also got her Jersey retired. The two time world cup champion, Olympic gold medalist, 121 appearances for Seattle, 54 goals, 28 assists. The banner was revealed and it read, quote, you changed the game. Um, there were so many people that were just celebrating her. Um, you know, so many people were saying how much they have impacted their decisions to go on and play the same sport or just a competitive sport in general. But when we talk about how well or how monumental this moment is for both Megan and Maya and just what it means to kind of see them get their flowers and to get them while they were still able to smell them. You know, I think sometimes we celebrate our legends a little bit too late. It wasn't something that a lot of people were able to celebrate in unless you were in the building. And why is that, Alicia? 
Well, number one, I thought the promotion in itself of these two Jersey retirements wasn't great. You know, Mm. we usually see it everywhere even before it happens so that we know that it's happening. And a lot of people were like, wait, what is going on? It just happened. Like, I didn't even know this was happening. So I feel like the promotion leading up to it could have been better. And then also, I feel like one of the things that leagues in general, but I would also say like women's sports specifically, they're missing these like key big pivotal moments to put on like national television or Mm -hmm. making sure that that game is available to everybody so they can consume it. And neither one of these, I think, one was on ESPN two, uh, the Megan Rapino. They, they did her, um, Jersey retirement on ESPN two, which was great. Uh, but Maya's wasn't at all. Like, I don't think you couldn't access it unless you had like a special like league pass or whatever. And I feel like that is a huge miss mm. because there are so many fans that, you know, some don't, can't afford that. Um, or some don't even really know about league pass or, or things of that nature where you could Mm -hmm. access a game that's not nationally televised. And I think Mm -hmm. while I don't think anybody shows the entire ceremony, Mm -mm. um, in its entirety on Mm -hmm. the broadcast, just having the opportunity to see that it's happening and get a little snippet of it, or even like an interview about like, what, how do you feel on this night? Like what is going through your mind? You know, that would be on national TV for her, her fans to consume. I think that needs to be improved on. Great. And Emma Emma points out a great point is that the Megan re, I'm sorry, the Maya retirement came when the Lynx were playing Caitlin Clark and um Indiana. So it's not like it wouldn't have been, you know, a prime real estate game if you will. Right. You know, I don't want to say a game that people weren't interested in, but obviously certain names and certain teams attract bigger eyes and that's just how the game goes. So the fact that it was not only Maya Moore's retirement, um, but it also was a game against the Lynx, who have actually who have absolutely been killing it all season, going against Caitlin Clark and the Fever. Caitlin Clark, obviously, as we know, is in the running for Rookie of the Year. It's kind of odd that that wasn't a game that was already on national television. Seeing how many nationally televised games the Fever actually have, the fact that that was also the Maya Moore retirement should have just been an additional one or one could have been swapped. I don't know. It just seemed a little like a miscue. Well, and when you take it down, like at the end of the day, it's not smart for, it's not business savvy either Mm -hmm. not to capitalize on these Mm -hmm. moments. Not that you want it to be just about that, but it doesn't make sense to me in that vein or in that sense. So I don't understand. It's like, you know, when these things are happening far in advance, make sure that it's on there. So everyone can consume it and, yeah, like, like I feel like the, the the W doesn't have the opportunity to flex, like you know, like the NFL, for example. If like there's a bad game later in the season, they flex it out for a team that's actually like doing well, and that's the prime. Does the WNBA not have the power to flex out games this late into the season for others? Like I I do not believe so. But regardless, like this date was known far, far, far in advance. Like, it wasn't like a yes. yesterday thing. So they definitely had time to make sure that that game was televised in the way that it should have been. The same growing pains, growing pains, growing pains, but definitely a missed opportunity. So that's yeah. unfortunate. Definitely unfortunate. Well, one thing that we were fortunate to have is an amazing interview with the one and the only Lindsey Vaughn, Ashley, I'm surprised the hearts didn't pop up. I know. Um, <laughs> I'm surprised. Maybe art. No, nope. maybe I lost. Maybe you jinxed it, and that's why it doesn't happen. I anymore. might have. Maybe I disabled Later. it. Oh, 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 there you go. There they go. <laughs> well, listen, all the hearts for Lindsey Vaughn, and we have our interview for you right now. Over here, fangirling in every single way because we have the one and only. I mean. I don't even think you really need an introduction because everybody knows who you are. They should if they don't. But Mm -hmm. the legend, Lindsay Vaughn, thank you so much for joining us. You guys are too kind. Thank you. It's so nice to be on. No, and thank you for joining us. Listen, I heard last night, like your plane was hit by lightning. And so like, I am so, I honestly like the fact that you're here. I can't, I'm so thankful, but also, are you okay? Like, what was that experience like? I can't even imagine. 
I was, I mean, I, when we were taking off, um, there was, a, the lights were flickering and I knew something had happened, but everyone seemed to be calm. And then when we landed, they said, we didn't want to alarm you, but we had a huge strike of lightning on the very nose of the plane. And we're all okay, nothing happened. But um, I was actually talking to myself before the flight and there was a huge storm. I'm like, are we actually going to fly in this? Is this safe? And then, and then I got struck by lightning, but I feel like I'm pushing my, um, my nine lives. I've crashed so many times. <laughs> in the game, so I'm one, one life closer to the end, I think. Oh my God. Don't say that between lightning. And you, if, I don't know if any of you have ever had a bird hit the plane. It's just, that's mm. insane too. Like it's not, that's not, it's good. not fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a fun time. No, not definitely at not. all. We're here. We're here. Yeah. Not a fun time. I mean, but you talk about your your nine lives, if you will, and you make a joke of it, but there's just been so much that has kind of been thrown at you in your career. I mean, you had knee replacement surgery. I mean, how are you feeling first and foremost? We'll start there. Thanks. I feel I feel great, actually. Uh, the best I've felt in probably the last 10 years. Um, I, ha I had a hard time before standing and walking, and I couldn't go on hikes with like my friend's seven year old, I would, my knee would hurt too bad and I would have to stop. And now I can pretty much do everything that I want. I'm weightlifting, I'm playing tennis. I'm super happy. I don't have pain anymore. So it was a very successful surgery. I'm very, very thankful. And um, I knew it was going to be a long road, but I, I feel like I'm on the right side of it now. When you talk about good quality of life and you were just over in Paris living your best life <laughs> at the Olympics. <laughs> and you said that this was one of the best Olympics you've ever watched. Uh, why was this so special? Like what made it so special? Uh, it was so much fun. I mean, the back between the backdrop and the excitement and the celebrities, it was like, you know, all of these worlds were colliding. And I also think that it was just a really important time for us to all come together. Um, I feel that, you know, the last Summer Olympics um, with COVID was just kind of a nightmare and we needed something to kind of unite us in a more modern and um, different way. And I thought Paris was was perfect. I mean, it was so scenic and like historic and, and just amazing. And I mean, Tom Cruise was there, so <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and like just jumping, jumping off of buildings. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that does it for me. But there's so many amazing Olympians. You know, America obviously did incredibly well. I think if the, you tallied the women's um, medal count, we would be third in the nation's ranking, which is insane. Um, and it was just, it was so fun to watch. I feel like everyone was in such great spirits, positive, you know, successful, overcoming adversities, you know, all of those things all came together and it was magical. What is it about the Paris Olympics that you want to see just heightened, be made better? I mean, it's coming back on American soil. That's going to be huge for us in 2028. You mentioned how well done Paris was and just the feeling. I mean, we have our hands full with trying to be better. What do you want to see done specifically to go ahead and give us the edge over Paris in four years? I mean, I think we can do a better job on the opening ceremonies. <laughs> I think we For can. Sure. I think we can. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think once the kind of the Olympic flag got passed to LA and, you know, we had Snoop and Dr. Dre and Adele, it was like, you know, that was amazing. And I think that set the tone. I think we're going to have amazing energy. It's, I think, mainly for LA, the problem will most likely be how do we contain the traffic situation, <laughs> um, which, you know, is already a problem <laughs> as it is. Uh, but I think, you know, everyone's going to be excited about it. We have so many um, people that are involved in 28 games that are excited and um, are going to help push it. I think we'll have pretty spectacular venues. Um, it's not going to be by the Eiffel Tower, but I think we'll make up for it in other ways. Yeah, for sure. Well, speaking of having the Olympics on U.S. soil, you were instrumental in bringing the Olympics to Utah, Salt Lake City in 2034. What does it mean to you to have the Winter Olympics in Utah? I mean, I my first Olympics were in Salt Lake in 2002. I know that dates me, um, but it was so such an important moment in U.S. history with, you know, right after 9-11, we were in just 
shambles, basically, the entire country. And it was such a unifying moment. And I know 34 is a long ways away, but I think we still could have the same kind of an impact. Um, I know we have LA 28, but I don't know, Winter Olympics, they're special too. And I, for me, you know, I'm really excited about having a family village. Um, we always have, and we always talk about the athlete village, but something that no one talks about or really supports or represents is actually the families. And that's something that I'm really hoping to change. You know, we're, we're going to have the family village. We're going to help them with tickets and transportation mm -hmm. and, and, you know, uh, all of the things that we should always be providing, but never have, which is mm. shocking because without the families, we have no athletes and it shouldn't be you know, that people have to take out loans to figure out how to get themselves to the games. And I think, you know, one of the things that I would say has improved in the Olympics and then overall just in sports is the way that mental health is talked about. I know, um, you know, from Simone Biles to Michaela Schifrin to, I mean, you, you have been very transparent with, you know, the ways that you've dealt with depression and things of that nature. Um, how do you feel, you know, it has helped you just in your journey to be transparent about it? And um, in what ways do you feel there still needs to be some improvement within the mental health space when it comes to sports? I think athletes have so many more resources now. I mean, when I started talking about mental health in 2012, uh, it was still like, what is she talking about? And mm. what is this? And, you know, Michael Phelps kind of joined in and Kevin Love and we started the conversation, but now it's very openly talked about and athletes have, you know, psychologists that they can call, they have resources, they have support. Like most teams have someone on staff that's there for their mental health. Um, and that was so not the case when I was an athlete, that was like very far from the norm. Um, so I think things are getting better in that regard. And I think it's important for us to always continue the conversation and make sure that it's not just a flash in the pan, that the resources continue to come in and we continue to address mental health because it's not just athletes. Obviously, it's everyone, um, especially kids. So if this can be a conduit to getting mental health to other people, have that access be broader, that's a great start. Um, but it really needs to be more widespread than that. But Again, like I think that's the one great thing about um, the Olympics is that you get all of these resources. And I mean, when you go to the Olympic Village, you can literally get any uh, medical treatment you ever wanted. You can get an MRI, oh, wow. higher body if you want. You can get your teeth cleaned, you can get your hair cut. Like they have every single thing that you could ever want. And now thankfully there's mental health resources as well. So you kind of get everything. I absolutely love talking to Lindsay. I just love her honesty, her transparency, just everything about her. And she even said, listen, LA, you're going to have to do it big because she loved Paris. She said, though, she has full faith in Los Angeles. She was telling us the biggest issue is going to be the traffic. But once that torch was passed to Billie Eilish and, and Adele and, and Snoop Dogg and all those people, it was on and popping. Like, LA... Yeah. You up next, boy. Like, let's go. <laughs> yeah, when Tom Cruise came out and was doing all the little stunt stuff he'd be doing, I was like, okay, LA, we here. We yeah. here. And I love what she has planned for the Winter Olympics, too. I think we're, everyone gets so excited about the summer, and I feel like the summer is, like, the sexier Olympics, if you will. People don't really give the same coverage and love to the Winter Olympics. But she's doing so much, and she tells mm -hmm. us, you know, why it was so important for her to bring it back to the States eventually, and all the stuff she's planning on doing and just got very real about like her mental health and just everything that you could want from a conversation from someone who's been in the Olympics and has done it multiple times, you know, she gave in that interview. So well, yeah. And um, the family village part that she was talking about too. Yes. I literally, it's like not something you like truly, truly think of is like, no, the families need a place to stay too. Right. But yeah. it, it was very, there was a lot of things in that interview that I was like, wow, like it just made me think about what we could do in future Olympics, you know, to make it even better than it yeah. already is. So. And like when she was talking about some of those athletes, like having to take out like massive loans or going into debt to like bring their mm -hmm. family to so mind blowing because you forget sometimes not all of these athletes are making the same coin. 
Like no, not at all. It's not even remotely close to the same thing. So just a very interesting conversation from a multitude of different angles. You can catch the entire interview on our YouTube page. So make sure you check that out. But right now we are going to switch gears to Connecting Changes Everything presented by AT&T. We are now welcomed by our favorite guest, one of our favorite guests. I shouldn't discriminate amongst our guests. Jenny <laughs> Chu is in the building to talk us through about everything going on in the NWSL. First of all, welcome, Jenny. How are you doing? Welcome back to the show. You're like a regular on the show at this point. I know. I love it. I'm so excited to be a regular. And I was called the favorite. I know you had to, for political reasons, political not reasons. choose, um, but okay. I appreciate it nonetheless. Happy to be with you guys. Yes. Listen, and there's a lot to talk about, specifically the CBA. For those who don't know what that means, it means collective bargaining agreement. Now, last week, the league and its players um, association announced that the agreement that eliminates both the college and the expansion drafts grants unrestricted free agency to all players and includes guaranteed contracts. Now, this is a huge moment for people who can't really grasp that magnitude because it's a lot of big words and a lot of legalities, if you will. This makes it the first pro sports league in the United States to eliminate a college draft. Although it's not uncommon in pro soccer for there not to be a draft, all players now become free agents with the league unveiling its initial list of players eligible to become free agents under the new CBA on Monday. Now, before we kind of cap some of the highlights, because there's a bunch of highlights that we want to go ahead and put a spotlight on. I mean, Jenny, just a general consensus of what this is, how people are feeling. This is a big deal. I mean, as someone who covers the NBA, it's almost unheard of to not have a draft, you know? So this is this is kind of going against the way things are, I don't want to say normally done, but for lack of a better word, normally done. No, you're right. The way that things are normally done in American sports, right? But right. soccer, football is a very worldwide sport. And to be able to compete with those other leagues that are around the world, you have to kind of understand that they don't have a draft. They have nothing like that. You know, you're going into the pro and, and the academy um, making you a pro way earlier than that. And right. we've seen within MLS in America that that maybe we need to be done with that. And so now we see NWSL getting rid of the draft altogether. So this is a, this is a huge moment. And it maybe wouldn't make sense in an NBA or a WNBA um, kind of moment. But for soccer, it absolutely is the right decision. And, and yeah, it's an exciting time for sure. It's super exciting. It's more, like you said, the international way of doing things. I mean, we hear about some of the biggest names, you know, in football overseas across the pond, joining soccer clubs as early as 15, 14 years old. So this is definitely not unheard of in every other part of the world. So some of the highlights of this change, um, it raises the minimum salary and the salary cap. The cap will increase each year based on league revenues. Um, includes revenue sharing, no limit on individual players' max salaries. So I know the players are thrilled with that. Chartered flights allowed for up to six legs within the league season. Additional charter flights are required in different scenarios, including for midweek games. So that's beneficial as well. All trade and transfers now require player consent. First and foremost, I mean, that is what we like to call a no trade clause in the NBA. That is major to go ahead and have a say so in where you end up, where you don't end up mm -hmm. is absolutely huge. I mean, Alicia, we cover this a lot in the basketball world. It is not unheard of for an organization, a franchise to do what's best for the franchise, regardless of how lawyer how loyal a player has been to that organization, how many years they've been in that organization. Well, know. and actually, I was actually going to say when yeah. I worked in the NBA, that was one of the things I absolutely hated was yeah, that a player sure. could get traded in the middle of a game, right before a game, wherever, you know, whatever time there was no say in it. it yeah. Happened at will. And then that whole entire family, you know, that we knew and we loved and mm -hmm. they loved us, they were just gone. Think you know, about I mean, think about Drew Holiday and how he got traded from Milwaukee, and the next day, an entire front page article in the local newspaper was just detailing how much he loves the city and wants to stay in the city, and his family loves it, and he what? was no longer a buck, which is just 
crazy. So, I mean, Jenny, let's work backwards a little bit. First, let's talk about the fact that players now have consent and a say-so in their future, in their careers. That's huge. Oh. The way that you you kind of said that they could be traded within a game, you know, right before a game, after a game, like that, that is so hard and it's so difficult, you know, especially you're talking about NBA, right? Like that's more your guys' realm. You have money to relocate. You have money to kind of like have people put things in order for you. When you're talking about an NWSL salary and you're picking up and moving and getting your life together with barely any money to kind of make a living wage, mm -hmm. talk about the amount of money. I know you mentioned the minimum salary raising when I came out the minimum when I came out of college not to age myself but uh, the minimum salary was 16k 16k for an entire year how wow. much you really do anything and then now you're asked to be to pick up and leave and, and go you know break a living contract and then go and go to another team I mean there's so much involved there and that, that minimum salary now is raised to 40k this year right and that will continue to raise with um the increase of revenue that that NWSL makes but Yes, the fact that these players have agency, they have autonomy, they get to decide. Um, the elimination of the draft adds to that free agency, no trades without player consent. All three of those go into the player having power, and that's exactly what you need. And then that forces clubs to have to be attracted to these players, right? Because if you want the mm -hmm. top players in the league, you want the best players, um, you mm -hmm. have to have good facilities, you have to have good standards as a workplace, good resources, all aspects of what goes into a player's decision of where they're going to play has to be at a high level. So now all of these teams are going to be fighting to make sure that their team is attractive and it's a good workplace to go to. That raises the standard across the league, across all teams, and makes everything better for everybody, honestly. Well, and Jenny, you talked a little bit about revenue sharing. When when you just said that, you talked about revenue sharing. Can you break that down? Because I don't think people really understand what that is and what goes into that. Okay, beautiful. So we'll talk about the money aspect later because some of the things are easier to understand. Like I mentioned, the 16K to now 40K. Um, right. You know, before we were living with host families and now they have, you know, they're playing, they're paying for housing as well. So all of that compensation stuff has been covered and people kind of understand all that. Um, I kind of got into the weeds of what revenue sharing means because I wasn't actually totally sure what that meant um, until I go into, into this. We so love someone who does their research. Go yeah, ahead. Thanks. Now. <laughs> okay, so one of the one of the big things is that there is going to be a minimum spend. So, for example, um, they have they have the exact numbers, right? The base salary cap each year has been laid out for these years. So, 2025 is going to be 3.3 million, and now there will be a minimum spend for these clubs. So, yes, your your base salary cap is is 3.3, but if you spend, say, right, they haven't released this number yet, they haven't decided, or they haven't released it because the contract itself hasn't been released. We're going to say 2.6 million. Say that the club spends 2.6 million. Okay. Okay, half of the teams spend 2.6 million on their team, their players, their contracts, whatever it may be. They now opt in or qualify for a minimum $200,000 revenue share, right? That's right now, at least it's going to be, at least is what it, it lays out as $200,000 base salary cap each year. So then that now $200,000 goes into a pool to be able to be available for the uh, player. Okay. So now these players, because if the team, right, that means that you want your team to go ahead and spend the amount of money that the NWSL is going to lay out. We're giving the example of 2.6 million. If they hit that, then they are opting into this $200,000 extra money they will have to spread between their players, right? That then depends on the contract on how that, you know, gets determined. But the fact that they opt into that extra money is massive. So you want your team to do that. It's not automatic though, right? So these teams have to spend the money to have more money for their players, which means you're spending more money, you're getting better players, you're getting better facilities, better you know resources for these teams. And so that's how the revenue share works. It's not like an automatic, like the NWSL makes more money, so the players make more money. It's yes, but no, right? Like there is opting into it. You have to, as a club, hit the minimum and the minimum hasn't been released yet, but if it's 3.3 .3 is the cap, then you're thinking, you know, within the two point, something range. Um, so that was incredibly interesting to understand. Does that make sense? That like then no, incentivi incentivizes the teams to pay players more right. and then gives them more money available to pay the players after it. It definitely makes sense. I do think that, you know, when you start talking about revenue sharing, there are some leagues and there are some teams who are kind of against it because when you talk about certain leagues, for example, there are some that make a just a quadruple, right. triple, double, like you put the number on it. They're like the top earners when it comes to the league, you think when you think NFL, you think like the Dallas Cowboys, you think basketball, you think like the Lakers. And, you know, when you think about uh, the WNBA, it's the aces. And then it's a, a drastic fall off between it. I think the Dallas wings actually are number one now, Alicia, because of their recent investors and things like yeah. that. So when you look at that, what is making a team, a club rather, that's like a top earner 
and really bringing in most of that revenue, are they now responsible then for the clubs that necessarily don't? Because that's sometimes where things get, I feel like a little muddy and a little sticky. You feel like, or some franchises will feel like, well, we're kind of holding down the fort for everybody else. And that's not really No, fair. because like, it's my club. So okay. you don't automatically opt in. So yes, when you were saying like you have to spend an X amount of money, it's by club. So not every club is going to qualify if they're not spending the money. Uh, so yes, it makes okay. sense because you're talking about the earners are these higher clubs, you know. So for example, uh, the newer clubs that came into the league, but to buy into the league was so expensive and they had the mm -hmm. money to do it in comparison to the teams that had been there forever and didn't have any money. Yes, there is a discrepancy in that. But if you want your team to be competitive, you have to be able to spend the money to get these players and to have the resources so that players want to come to you. Now, with the players having more agency as well, that makes yeah. you even more likely to put the money involved to get the players that you need. When you say, okay, I have a locker room that looks like a high school locker room. Come be a professional soccer player here. Who's going to want to go play there? When you you're say, right. I have the same locker room as Real Madrid, and I'll give you a hotel room the night before. You know, like... And your individual suites and all that all good this stuff. All does, Ashley, yeah. is improve things for the players. Like, yeah. everyone winning here is the players. Yeah, they're definitely winning on every single level. And one thing I really loved about this was that it was really proactive instead of reactive, right? Like mm. they weren't just waiting for, you know, oh, we have this deadline. Let's just throw this, you know, in or sign this or or not put a lot of thought into it or give the players what they should have. It, it really was what they deserve, you know? Right. So it and being league-led league, league led is, is a wonderful thing to point out, Alicia. The fact that NWSL apparently came to the table to meet with NWSLPA is huge because that seems like it's all in good intent. Um, but then you have to think about like, why would they do this? And one of the things is like the landmark media deal is 40 mm -hmm. times greater than it had previously been. So the amount of money that they have, like you need to be sharing that with the people that are actually creating the product, right? So to go Absolutely. from 40 times greater in, in terms of this media deal. So, so yeah, I mean, it, you want to be able to support the players to have living wages. And now we're seeing that, right? We're seeing that increase in compensation across the board. And then the revenue sharing aspect is something that I find incredibly interesting. And, and I know that it's, you know, more available in, in NBA, you see things like that, but to now have it on the NWSL front, that makes all the players, you know, want to be on better teams, want to be, you know, it, giving a better product so that NWSL is making more money. Their club is making more money. It's just like, it all works in tandem. And when right. you talk about that media deal, I mean, the CBA expires in 2030 and the current rights deal expires the following um, 2027 season. So it's definitely something that was well thought out, was well planned out to all kind of, you know, follow a chronological order of events to better um, the league as a whole. But I mean, let's talk about the negotiating power of this all. I mean, not only from a player standpoint, but from a league standpoint as well. I mean, now the league, I feel like is in a great position to kind of, you know, make sure that they get the best media package that they possibly can to showcase what they're doing. And there's been a significant growth that the metrics will back that up or in you at least hope that the people making those decisions look at everything as a whole and not pick apart certain things and use that to determine what those that next wave of media deal will look like. Right. We saw an incredible increase in viewership um, across the years that CBS had the rights for NWSL. And that then opens the door for this 40 times the amount of money media deal. Right. Because these business people are not making decisions out of the goodness of their heart. They're making it because there's actually a product that is selling. We're seeing this in the WNBA right. as well. And now when there is a media deal that gives eyeballs, that then means sponsorships come into play. So the amount of money that women's soccer is playing with is unprecedented in America. Right. We've never seen this amount of money within it. Um, with women, women's sports in general, like that's something that you guys have seen as well as hosts of this. Like there are now opportunities that we never had before. Um, and it just, it opens a lot of doors. It opens a lot of doors. Well, and if I'm the WNBA and I see this, like I better follow suit because let me tell you, and the, and the WNBA PA actually posted about this on their yeah. social channels, basically saying like, this is what you should be doing. Okay. So, well, so let's get this cracking. <laughs> I'm glad I am glad you brought that up, Alicia, because um, this is a huge moment also for the WNBA because they can opt out of their current CBA in November 
um, which when, you know, the new media deal was announced, you know, the change between, you know, Turner and all that stuff, you know, the WNBA also obviously being part of the NBA was affected by that. People were unhappy um, with that number. People thought it could have been a lot higher when you break down the metrics and all. It probably could have been a lot higher. The negotiating wasn't the best. Whoever was in charge of solidifying that number as a whole. But I mean, Alicia, I'll start with you. I mean, what stands out? What as currently in the CBA for the WNBA kind of stands out to you as a thing that you would really want to see the biggest change on? And what is your hope rather? Because, you know, getting everyone to vote the same way is hard. We've seen this before. It sometimes affects how CBAs are able to be moved forward or not be able to move forward because everyone, at the end of the day, you want it to be a collective decision, but people got to look out for themselves too. They got families to feed. They got their own situations. Um, So your hope, obviously, is everyone collectively agrees to opt out and put themselves in a better situation. So in a perfect world, if that is what happens, what is, if you could only change one thing, what would it be? That's Only so one. hard because there's so many things that I think need to be changed. Let me okay. just make that clear in the beginning. Yes. But the revenue sharing is definitely something that all the players have talked about. Um, you know, Kelsey Plum has, you know, this thing that has gone around social a lot that a lot of people have shown because what she said was, we're just trying to make what's owed to us and what's due. You know, like we see the growth, we see what's happening, we see the money that is being, you know, invested in and also gained with these advertisers and and obviously with the television deal, like you can't deny that. And so we want what we deserve. We want that. And when you look at this with the CBA for the NWSO, they got all of that and more. So it's mm-hmm. like when you look at this as a blueprint, every other women's league and every actually more than just a women's league i think leagues in general right yeah um see the way that it should be done you know and they see the way that you know is it perfect obviously no like not every cba is gonna be perfect but it's close you know what i'm saying this was a a a landmark cba that i think every single league should be taking a look at because they set a precedence on how it should be and how the players should be treated Mm -hmm. moreover. So, you know, when it comes to the WNBA, revenue sharing is obviously a huge deal. Um, But there's so many other things that they need to look at this and say, hey, we need to do right. by. We'll dive into that a little bit more in depth as it gets closer. But Jenny, before we let you go, I mean, as someone who's been in this since, you know, the very beginning stages and, and when people weren't quote unquote watching like they're watching now, and it was really a struggle to get you know, eyes and dollars. I mean, how special is this moment for the NWSL, women's soccer, just as a whole, women's soccer players as a whole, and this precedent that it can possibly set, you know, for the next generation that's coming up? That, that's a great question because we've seen so much change within the last few years. When we talk about this original one that was in 2022, which is recent, right? We talk about the NWSL came to the table and amended and extended this one. Um, that one was all about player protection because they're coming off the, the back end of all of the, the accusations of abuse and not even accusations of proof of abuse um, in different ways. So that CBA was all about protecting the players after that and making sure that they were okay. This one is all about making sure that what's theirs is theirs and that they mm-hmm. are you know, be, being given in um, the, the needs that they need to succeed. We talk about that 16K difference to 40K minimum. And you're going to fight about that, you know, like the 40K, nobody's going to want to go for the 40K knowing that's the minimum now and that there is so much money involved. But then you have more money involved with that because there's sponsor um, opportunities and the revenue sharing opportunities. So you're not just capped at the 40 as well. I mean, there's so much more to it, right? But the fact that we go from, from a potential, you know, closing of the league even, you know, like when you talk about those abuse scandals, that is a a moment where you could have either broken, that could have broken the camel's back that, you know what, we don't want to deal with this. This is too much to to handle and and so much money and lawyer and whatever is going into it to now be in a position where they're breaking ground as a women's, you know, sports team that has a new CBA that has, you know, broken everything we've ever seen before and setting a precedent, for example, for the WNBA is beautiful to see. And as someone who has always been saying, you've got to give money. I mean, put your money into women's soccer, put your money into women's soccer. I've been saying it since the beginning. These women are amazing. This is a landmark moment, you know, and I, and I hope that it only gets better from here because 
that's that's what a contract is, right? It'll only get better from here. From, the CBA is not going to go like worse from here. No, no, no. You continue to like make sure that these players are, are getting more and more and, and providing instances where the league can be successful and continue to thrive. Well, listen, to your, from your lips to the soccer gods' ears, I hope they are listening. Jenny, thank you so much, as always, for the knowledge, for the breakdown. My math was not good enough to follow along completely with revenue yeah. sharing, so I'm going to have to go ahead and read up on that. I hope that, that what I more. said made sense, because I've been like totally trying to sense. Sense. simplify it as my subject. much as I'm possible. I'm still the girl who counts with her fingers if it's after a certain, don't, don't, don't use me uh, as your audience. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm not the one. It was the um, breakdown we needed, though, for it sure. It was the breakdown we needed. Whether we followed along or not, we needed it. And it hit the message hit who it was supposed to hit. Uh, Jenny, thank you so much, as always. And we can't wait to have you back on the show. Thanks, ladies. I'll see you later. All right, Ashley. So it's time for one of our favorite segments. What's up now? And this Friday, we are going to see the final regular season matchup between the Indiana Fever and the Chicago Sky. So what a lot of people like to call Caitlin versus Angel, right? But what are you looking forward to seeing in this matchup, in this last regular season matchup between these two teams and then also Angel and Caitlin? Okay, so I'm going to start with Angel and Clay Caitlin because I think that that's the nucleus of everything else. Um, obviously, you're going to see which team looks better at this point in the season because we remember in the standings, it was, you know, eight and nine, I think is where they were before the hiatus. and you know, we said that both of these teams were teams you had to watch coming after the break, how much they both could have utilized the break. The teams in general could have utilized the break, but specifically these two rookies here. Obviously, when we're talking about the rookie of the year race, it comes down to these two girls right here. And after this matchup, obviously, obviously there's a lot of basketball left to be played. But I do think that people are going to have burned in their memory specific voters, specifically the voters mm -hmm. of these awards, about who got the best of who in this final showdown. Think of this as kind of like the end of like a trilogy in a movie series, right? The, the last movie is what you have in your head. How that movie ended is what your lasting memory of the franchise as a whole is. So there's a lot of basketball to be played even after they match up. But I think whoever gets the best of the other in this specific matchup will go ahead and give themselves a little push ahead of the competition when it comes to this rookie of the year race. And I think for me, that's the most exciting thing. I think these girls know what this final matchup will do for them when it comes to the rookie of the year race. I expect full tenacity. I expect energy. I expect trash talking. I expect just phenomenal basketball. It's going to be fun to watch because you go into it and you say, oh, it's just a regular game, but it's not. It's the final showdown. Wild Wild West standoff. This is going to, it's going to be fun to watch. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, definitely not a regular game by any means. Fun to watch. I agree with you on all fronts, but I'm also just excited to see them both do their thing yeah. and also to see how their teams are continually, continually coming together after this break, um, every single game, not just one on Friday, but every single one is so important in the race to rookie of the year and important in the race for, especially with the fever, because they have been saying like, we are going to make the playoffs. Like, I mean, not to say that Chicago doesn't, but I'm just saying with their standings, with right, the way right, that right. their team has been going, um, every single one of these games is imperative uh, for both Caitlin and Angel. So while this one does carry a heavy, heavy weight for all the things that you said, I'm just really excited to see um, them play all the games. You know, we hit, it's a imperative time right now at where we are in the season. Um, you know, the regular season, there there's still a lot of basketball to be played, but it's not. It's going to go by like that. So it's going to go by very quickly. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I'm just at, at this point, what's up now is every game for me. Yeah. Less you than know? a month of the yeah. regular season. I mean, let's talk about these two girls though quickly. I mean, Angel Reese, three straight 20 rebound games, most by any WNBA player in a single season. When we talk about Caitlin Clark, uh, 19 points on Monday, she set a WNBA record 21st game with at least 15 points and five assists in a single season. Let's go ahead and give both of these girls credit. I think Angel Reese came out the gate swinging a little bit better than Caitlin did, who was not having a good first few weeks it was taking her some time to get acclimated to figure it out but 
I just love that both these girls, obviously they're not anywhere where they're going to be next season, the season after that. But I just love that both of them, much like many of us knew they would, have found their footing a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because all of those narratives back, you know, in the very beginning of the season where people were like, is Caitlyn ready for the WNBA? Is she a fluke? Is Angel Reese, you know, focused more on her extracurricular things? And she is back. The girls are fine, as you can see. Like, so now we can just remember that you got to give rookies a chance to get acclimated. And let's not jump the gun in our conclusions of their careers as a whole and their transition from college to the professional league as quickly as I think a lot of people did very early in that season. Right. As you can see, it's all working out. Yes, fine, thriving, making history like almost every single night. Starting podcasts, Angel Reese yeah. just announced her podcast, Unapologetically Unapolo Angel, mm -hmm. today. So, I mean, they're thriving. Both yeah. of them are thriving, and I love to see it. Um, I, I want to see them thrive each and every night. And it's, it's going to be real interesting with this Rookie of the Year um, as we're getting closer and closer to people voting and making decisions. But definitely uh, something that is phenomenal to watch. And, and what I love, and we were, we were talking about this kind of, at break was that both of these girls are going to be dominating this league for so many seasons to come. And there's going to be a next wave and the following wave, and there'll be another name probably in that mix. But one thing I love about these two girls specifically, and we talk about this all the time on the pod is how much their, their careers have been intertwined going back to college, but also how their individual interests are going to also give them their own lane. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we know what Angel's into. She's into the beauty and the fashion and, and she and started business. a podcast. And yeah. And she's business more in general business in general. She has her Reebok line that just dropped and she's more um, outspoken sometimes, you know, with, you know, her kick, you know, her clapbacks and things like that. And she has her podcast and Caitlin's more of like, you know, behind the scenes and just strictly like it's the Wilson basketball and it's it's this with basketball and that. She's like super, super hoops. And like maybe she'll have interest outside of that as she gets more comfortable in, in the league. But she's a little bit more quiet and reserved and behind the scenes. I love how their stories are intertwined. They're both killing it, you know, when it comes to what they're doing on the court. But there's also so much individuality in the two of them that they can just dominate this league in such different spaces. And both of those spaces will be so instrumental to growing the league in different ways. And I love that because I think a lot of the times they're try people try to like pit them against each other because they share, you know, so much history when it comes to the sport, but there's also so much room for them to just be individuals because of their interests and what they're in and what they're doing that. I love that. Like there's, overlap but there's also a lot of separation and i think that's so cool i think that's very very cool i think it's cool too and i think they're just being exactly who they are like yeah. which is a beautiful thing to see that not a lot of women athletes were able to do in the past or even athletes right you could say they weren't able to express who they are do the clapbacks even that are merited like speak up for yourself and people are doing that now <laughs> you know what i'm saying like they weren't able to before let's let's be clear. yeah and so it's a beautiful thing to see how they're literally growing and thriving and being individuals and standing up for who they are and being who they are like i love yeah. that we love it for sure well i just want to say we've had a great show on so many levels and we're definitely going to do this again next week as we do every week right here on we need to talk now so definitely subscribe like comment um do all the things if you if you don't want to watch us i don't know why you wouldn't but if you don't <laughs> make sure you tap in with on your favorite podcast platform and we will be tapped in with you as we are every week right here on we need to talk now presented by at&t